Hello and welcome back to this Danville Idealistic Crusade. This video is the third in my series on my James Bond book collection. So the first deals with my uh, various Fleming original editions, and then the second deals with the uh, first of the continuation novels, basically uh, going from Kingsley Amos all the way through the end of the John Gardner era. So in 1997, we had the first novel of a new era, which of course was the Raymond Benson book, zero minus ten coming out the same year as the film tomorrow never dies and uh it's hard to believe this book is almost 25 years old now uh benson's tenure was uh, again a relaunching of the book bond and he really did bring a lot of fresh energy uh that was really sorely lacking in in the latter years of, of gardner's books which i still enjoy rereading those but they are uh, a, a bit problematic um they, they definitely needed some more energy to them, so I, I think it was uh, wise for the, the baton to sort of be passed. And, uh, of course, Benson had written the uh, the iconic 1980s Bible, uh, the James Bond Bedside Companion, and also a number of the early tech space uh, James Bond computer games. So uh, he was no stranger to the world of Bond, and while, you know, this Zero Minus Ten literally was his first novel, which... I, being a being a, a, a you know a, not quite an aspiring writer but just thinking about the idea of writing a book and your first book being a James Bond novel that would absolutely terrify me so I, I still uh, give him uh, just the absolute highest credit for being able to to uh, pull off this sort of achievement uh, but this started a new tenure so he wound up writing six novels which we'll, I will go over here uh, this being the uh, U.S. first edition of Zero Minus Ten his first from 1997 and then I will go through all the way up until the present with uh, the second and most current uh, Anthony Horowitz novel, Forever in a Day. This is the U.S. first edition uh, hardcover. So this will bring us all the way up to the present with the latest of the continuation novels. And of course, it's just been recently announced that Horowitz will continue and uh, write and publish a third James Bond novel, which is really great news because his two have been really, really enjoyable. And then to round things off, we will go further uh, after that into the world of Young Bond. So, of course, starting with the uh, Charlie Hickson series, which is really impressive and uh, uh, a nice highlight of the, uh, the last, you know, 10 to 15 years of James Bond in the literary world. Even though these are aimed at younger readers, uh, Hickson really uh, blended a knowledge of Fleming and uh, the, the world of... Uh, literature for for younger readers together in a way that makes these young bond books such a pleasure even for diehard bond fans like myself it doesn't matter that they're you know uh supposedly children's books they can be read as full-on novels and still be enjoyed so with that let's go off to the table and take a look at the rest of the james bond continuation novels so we start the Raymond Benson era with 1997's Zero Minus Ten, not only his first James Bond novel, but his first novel, period, which, of course, for any writer must be a, a enormous amount of pressure, let alone being a, a gigantic James Bond fan. Uh, Benson's era was a fresh shot of energy uh, for the James Bond novels at the time. I was still a bit too young. Uh, I, I was, of course, only seven years old by the time this novel came out. Uh, but I, I did become aware of the Benson novels as I grew up and started getting a hold of them and, and reading them consistently with the Gardner novels and the Fleming originals when I could uh, find them. Of course, my first experience was finding them in libraries, and then uh, I started picking them up when they, uh, when they came out new. I believe the first two that I picked up when they were brand new were probably double shot and uh, never dream of dying I remember buying the hardcover when it came out but um, I still enjoy going back to this this era of, of Bond and the novels uh, Benson is is sort of a, a hit or miss with most fans uh, of, of the books who have actually read uh, his his uh, six novels they they do have great energy to them and I think he does a very good job of getting Bond's internal monologue down pat. Uh, I do feel these books are underrated. I think he did come up with some really interesting plots, uh, chiefly here because you have a 1997 James Bond adventure that takes place during and around the Hong Kong handover, which features very heavily in the plot of the book. 
If you know anything about the Bond films, of course, you would know that that was the original plot and setup of Tomorrow Never Dies before it was changed uh, essentially at the 11th hour, the insistence of MGM and their board of directors. Because it was felt setting a film around the Hong Kong handover would uh, very heavily date the film, and of course the film would wind out coming uh, wind up coming out at the end of the year, months after the Hong Kong handover had already taken place. So that's what led to the film having many script problems and being rewritten essentially as they went along. But it's interesting to compare that to uh, Benson's Zero Minus Ten, where you have James Bond in the middle of the Hong Kong handover and uh, a very uh, a plot that could easily be adapted into a Bond film. You can see the the film uh, in your head as you read along, uh, which is honestly a, cont- a part of all of Benson's novels. He did later admit that he was sort of directed to write with the films in mind in certain fashions. So I do think you could almost picture the Pierce Brosnan Bond uh, type of film universe uh, that we're used to with his four films. Uh, when you read the Benson novels, you can sort of at least get a sense and picture the, the films creeping in here and there. But uh, this this first novel is, is quite solid. I do enjoy coming back to it. Uh, and here I have the primary U.S. editions. I do have uh, all of the first U.S. hardcovers and paperbacks for all six Benson novels. And all of them follow the same general design for uh, both the hardcover and the paperback. So you will see this carry throughout all six books. So here, of course, is 0 minus 10 and its original U.S. first edition hardcover. I like the font. I like the overall layout. It's very simple, but uh, each book has a particular image used, uh, which fits the actual book itself. And they're all on nice, very bold uh, colored jackets. So it is sort of in keeping with what we saw on the iconic, bold colored John Gardner James Bond novels in their hardcover form. And we're still keeping with the James Bond logo on top, the title, uh, and it, it's sort of similar, again, to the sort of layout that was perfected by uh, all the John Gardner books of the 1980s. Then the spines all match, with, and they all keep this same form for all six books. And then the rear of all of them will have a specific passage, a notable passage from the book, uh, this being one of the best uh, when Bond decides to blast his way out of a uh, essentially a, a Chinese army base uh, after a, a really uh, particularly nasty torture sequence. And uh, this definitely sets up the uh, novel extremely well. Here's the book itself, and printed in here is this sort of triangle motif design that is used for the actual title page and so on and so forth. So that's that's a nice touch, and it's actually sort of embossed in here. And then the actual spine there, nice stylized font for the title. I like that the end papers are actually red. We're seeing here that uh, Benson was the author of the iconic James Bond Bedside Companion. There's that uh, triangle motif design. And of course, this is the original first edition. I'm going to move on to the paperback, and th- this is what I always think of when I think of the Benson novels. I think of the Jove white paperbacks in the U.S. with these matching designs. Again, here you can see clearly uh, the holdover from the John Gardner era. We have the James Bond Inn logo that was on the last few John Gardner novels of the 90s in their paperback form. Uh, But I really like this choice of going with a uniform white background design. Then you have a Bond silhouette, but here and on most of these, they are new ones. They're not reusing the ones from the Berkeley 80s paperbacks, uh, but there are some books where they wind up doing that anyway. And then there's always on these some design or motif or imagery to reference the actual setting or locale of where the book is set. And I just, I really like the layout of this. I think it looks very classy. And again, all of these match. You have a little bit of a blurb about its bestseller status. 
Now, unfortunately, this is the copy I've read many times and carried around, so it's definitely a bit beat up. I would like to find nice, clean replacements for, for some of these that are on the more worn side, but it is actually getting trickier to find uh, these copies because, of course, even the Benson novels are getting on up there in age, which is really starting to make me feel old. Then the rear, and again, all of these six Benson novels will follow in this same exact design in their paperback form. So this is the first paperback printing, which came out in August of 1998. Something else, I don't know if, how visible it is on here, but uh, there is already some yellowing of the uh, of, of the pages on the edges. Uh, this has suddenly started happening to um, several of my Benson paperbacks, and I think what it may be, it's the same thing I've noticed with the last two or three books in the Gardner run. So I think what it may be is when they switched over to Jove for uh, this era from like 94, 95, the last two Gardner paperbacks, and then the first couple of Bensons. Uh, I don't know if it's a cheaper paper stock or what it is, but all of a sudden I noticed that uh, there, there started to be some, some tanning and some yellowing on the edges of some of the pages of this particular era of Bond paperback. I don't know if it's just me or if it's my, my copies are starting to get way too well read, but that's just something I've noticed compared to uh, just different eras of the Bond paperbacks. Next, we move on to Benson's first novelization, which, of course, was for the film Tomorrow Never Dies, which released several months later in 1997 after the release of Zero Minus Ten. Now, with most novelizations, you will have the uh, bits of deleted material that was not included in the final cut, and most of the time, the writer is working off of an earlier shooting draft. So uh, that's why I love novelizations so much, because you usually get extra material, and also the writers, when they're really invested, will add great background or great inner character monologue and really enliven the overall experience. This novel is no real, no exception. Uh, there are some really nice additions, uh, of which my absolute favorite is Benson giving Carver a bit more uh, back history, particularly in his dealing with uh, finding his biological father and blackmailing him and then taking over his publishing empire. Uh, that's a really wonderful, twisted story that I wish was in the film. It's referenced in uh, the deleted bit, uh, or I should say, part of the deleted material in the uh, in briefing scene in the car. Uh, it's just a throwaway line, but here Benson really fleshes it out with like a full couple pages. It's also obviously based on an earlier version of the shooting script, which again was heavily rewritten as they went along. The film had many scripting problems due to the last minute shift away from being about the Hong Kong handover. So uh, in particular, the whole climax is a bit different. Uh, there's, there's different staging. Uh, there's a fight between Bond and Stamper on the exterior of the stealth boat outside the big hole that's blasted in the roof. Uh, in particular, I really like there's a, uh, I, again, I don't know because I've not been able to read an earlier shooting draft, so I don't know if it was part of the script or if Benson invented it, but the method of which uh, Bond uses an improvised explosive and the confrontation where uh, it's the Mexican standoff between uh, Bond and Gupta and uh, Carver and Wei Lin, uh, Bond directly addresses Wei Lin, and before there had been... Uh, more scenes between them that develop the romance further and there's a nice callback between them that references all the way back to the beginning of the film and the scene with uh, Bond brushing up on his Danish uh, but I would say the best thing overall about the novelization, we get more background into Wei Lin's character. Uh, there's a whole early scene of her on basically her own mission uh, unrelated to anything in the film story or plot line, almost like she gets her own pre-title sequence. It's a really nice little bit of action. Uh, I really enjoy having her character more fleshed out, which is a, a problem I do have with the film. And the romance between Waylon and Bond is far more developed in a natural way that 
uh, really helps the story, I think. So this is one of those that, I mean, I think all the novelizations are essential, but this one has a, not a, a lot of really nice flourishes. And again, the whole climax feels uh, much more improved in terms of stakes. There, there's more for Carver to do. Stamper's fate is entirely different uh, than what we see in the film. And again, as with most novelizations, there's a lot of really nice background. Unfortunately, this is the hardest of the Benson novelizations to find. Uh, very frustratingly, I saw it on a book rack as a, as a child when we were on a uh, a long uh, a long trip. I can't remember to where exactly, but I remember seeing it and begging my parents to to get it for me so I could read it in the car on this long trip and. Uh, my dad <laughs> refused, and then I could never find it again. And this was, of course, before uh, long before I had really discovered the magic of eBay. But even then, uh, this is still a very tricky book to try and find. It's the, definitely the hardest to find of the three. It seems like they didn't print very many because you rarely ever see it. And if you're trying to buy a copy online, you're usually going to have to pay a nice little premium just to get it in print. So the actual first copy I owned is actually the book on tape version here which uh, uses the different art that's on the British paperback. So uh, this is uh, presented on two cassettes and uh, never really had a good cassette player growing up. So I actually had to listen to this on my old uh, portable Walkman, which I did a number of times. Uh, it's it's a pretty decent version. I don't think it's, um, I don't, don't really think it's a bridge. I think it is the complete text, but uh, it's been many, many years since I listened to this particular version and my old Walkman has long since since died but I figured I would just pull it out so you could see it and uh, it, I don't know if anyone has actually uh, any memory or still has a, a version of this floating around well here it is in all its glory on two cassettes and then advertising as well the audio cassette version of the novelization of the postman it still has the little hype mailer to mail away and as always I think what would happen if I just dropped this in the mail today and then here are the two cassettes of Benson's novelization. So here is the U.S. paperback on the Berkeley Boulevard imprint. This uses the teaser poster image that we got for the film in advance. Uh, pretty nice layout. I, it looks really nice. And of course, I had vivid memories of always trying to find this book and always remembering that one random time I saw it in a truck stop as a kid and, and just never was able to uh, read it in print form until many many years later here is the spine and really nicely they of course used the film logo and title font and then my favorite touch is the rear actually uses the gun barrel from the film on the top of the rear jacket Now, of course, this is not in perfect shape, so there's some tanning on the covers and a little wear on the bottom, but I was just very happy to finally get a copy of this in, in really nice shape. Usually, I've, I've found this once or twice in person in used bookshops since getting this copy, and the only other two copies I've found were just totally beat to heck and, and destroyed. So, of course, this was released in December 97 to tie in with the film. As you can see, it's done in the exact same style as the 0 minus 10 paperback in terms of layout and, and text font. Next, we move to Benton's second novel, 1998's The Facts of Death. Here is the U.S. first edition with uh, the cover featuring what seems to be a, uh, I believe it's supposed to be a Greek coin in reference to having to put the coin under the tongue of the deceased so that they would have uh, a fare to pay uh, Charon or Charon or sometimes the pronunciations escape me, but in Greek mythology, uh, you would have to have a coin to, play, to pay Charon, the boatman of the river Styx, to carry you across into the realm of the dead. There's the spine. Nice bit of text on the back where, as usual, it seems that uh, Bond is about to have his six. Here's the book itself. And what they did here is made a little sort of embossed bit. I don't know how well this is going to come across on camera here. But if you look very closely, I'm trying to angle in the light a little bit. You can see there's this little box embossed in there, and you see the initials RB for the author, which I thought was was rather cute. And then here's the actual spine where you can read it. Of 
keeping with the red end papers of 0 minus 10. And here is the U.S. first edition Jove paperback. Of course, I still have fond memories of, uh, well, I don't know exactly if they're fond, but I have distinct memories of uh, saving up little scraps of money here and there and saving my allowance up to go in and actually uh, purchase these when they came out new in paperback form. So again, keeping with the same design, and here we have a silhouette of Bond in front of what I believe is supposed to be uh, the Acropolis or the Colosseum. So again, something to suggest the uh, Grecian setting. Again, matching spine, and I like that they have different colors to differentiate each book. should also mention that on all of these, everything you see on the cover is fully embossed. So the title, the James Bond logo, and uh, the author's name are all very nicely embossed. And the rear keeps with the same type of design. So, of course, this came out in August of 99. Next, we move on to Benson's third James Bond novel, which is 1999's High Time to Kill. Uh, myself and many fans of the novels, uh, it seems a general consensus for, it, it's hard to nail down uh, any author's particular best book. Everybody has their own opinions, but I think with the six Benson novels, it's it's a pretty good consensus, uh, and I think even even the author himself has, has, has said that this is, is probably his best book of his six Bond novels. This one, over time, and the more I reread these, I think this is the strongest of the six, and it basically starts off a trilogy of sorts, following in the way that uh, you could view the three of the Ian Fleming original novels as sort of the Blofeld or Spectre trilogy when you look at them and you go from Thunderball to Honor Majesty's Secret Service and to Only Live Twice. Whereas in Benson's uh, Bond novels, he creates a sort of new Spectre uh, or, or a new version of the Spectre type of organization uh, called the Union. So this is essentially part one of the Union trilogy, which would play out over the next two books. You don't really have to read them in order, and you don't have to read all three of them to understand the story that's being told, but it is nicely set up and linked to through the three books very well, something I think that the official films could actually learn a thing or two from if they're going to do this sort of uh, secret organization type deal again, uh, as they did originally in the 1960s. The setting is, of course, Bond in the Himalayas, which is set up nicely on the uh, book covers. Here we have the U.S. First Edition and uh, the U.S. First Edition paperbacks, of which I have two copies, my original one being a bit more beat up, and then I found this uh, other one that's a little bit cleaner. Of all of the Bond continuation novels, I think this would be this is one of the prime examples of, of a book that seems uh, ripe to be adapted for a film. Uh, there is such an a, a, a abundance of great material in this book. Uh, the setting alone, uh, the the action sequences, the the characters. There are, there are many great things that you can you can really envision the film of this book as you're reading it. Uh, so I, I think if the uh, if Eon were ever to officially start adapting continuation novels and we're looking for the one that seems uh, the most tailor-made for a film adaptation as it as it was originally published as it stands uh, this this is one of the chief examples one of the handful of all the continuation books that is is pretty much already set up as its own uh, a film and it seems like this might be more likely since the uh, the future is uncertain and inspector we finally had the first official acknowledgement of any usage of continuation material when a portion of the torture sequence from Kingsley Amos's Colonel Son was actually used in the film and credited that that was a first. So uh, again, the, the future is unwritten for uh, the, the future of the Bond films and if they might start pulling more from the many continuation novels. 
So here on the US original hardcover first edition, I have the same matching spine design. And then the rear changes up a little bit and carries over the uh, climbing figure from the front of the jacket. Here on the book itself, they've just gone with a very stylized 007 embossed in the front cover. There's the spine. Here, of course, on the end papers, it's not red, but this sort of ice blue teal, which again, is, I guess, supposed to suggest the notion of ice, which I guess is, is rather cute. So we move on to the paperback, which is what I am much more familiar with because, of course, uh, growing up, the paperbacks were what I had. And eventually, later on, I was able to piece together uh, all six of the original uh, first edition hardcovers, which I'm glad I did because now they are uh, much less prevalent than they once were. Of course, the copies are the same. It's just I picked up a second one without a crinkled spine keeping with the same design for everything. And of course, the front cover is still embossed. Then the rears are the same. So this came out a year after the hardcover in June of 2000. Now one last note about this particular novel, High Time to Kill was not the original title that Benson wanted to use. He wanted to use a title taken directly from a Fleming novel, but unfortunately this did not get approved by, uh, I, of course it would have been Glidrose, uh, later Ian Fleming Publications, that uh, that would have nixed this idea. But the irony is, of course, that uh, this book was released in 1999, the same year of the film, uh, the Bond 19, which Benson wrote the novelization for. Uh, the irony, of course, coming in the fact that the title that Benson wanted to use for his third James Bond novel, the one that was rejected for for not being appropriate enough was actually The World is Not Enough, which he wrote the novelization for, which I have here. So I just find that ridiculously ironic. And of course, The World is Not Enough is one of uh, Fleming's gr just most outstanding phrases and the fact that uh, simply tossed off as Bond's family motto on his crest and on a Manchester Secret Service uh, and never actually used as a title of a novel is just uh, un uh, incredible. And of course, when it was finally chosen as a title for one of the films, it was like, well, that's absolutely perfect. So uh, it would have made sense for Benson's novel as well, seeing as it was, you know, essentially at the r most remote peak uh, of, of, of height uh, achievable in the world in the Himalayas. But uh, of course, that was not to be. <laughs> and of course, it would have been confusing having that be the title of his novel in the same year of the leading up to the film. So here is the U.S. novelization again on the Berkeley uh, Boulevard imprint using the advanced image of the iconic Flame Girl advanced teaser poster that we got here in the States that's highly sought after uh, and very collectible and one of the signature James Bond images. Uh, just a, a real work of art that MGM came up with. So it looks beautiful here on this paperback. Nice to have the film's title font as well. And then the rear is pretty straightforward. Of course, this was released a time with the film, and this one is also not not easy to find. Uh, it took me a little while to track this one down. It's it's not quite as hard to obtain as Tomorrow Never Dies, but uh, it is relatively difficult to find. You're not going to find it every day in your local used bookstore. 
Again, there are some nice extra bits of material here. There is some stuff that was uh, deleted from the original film, the theatrical release version. But also, crucially, there is some extra character detail and inner character monologues. The best thing is the entire backstory for Renard and the extra detail about the development and inner workings of the Renard-Electra relationship that is only... Uh, fleetingly glimpsed or barely hinted at in the film. It's one of my major problems with the film. I always want more of the uh, Renard Electra conundrum, and uh, here that is uh, much more fully fleshed out in the novelization. And now, armed with this knowledge, every time I go back and rewatch the film, I'm able to read further into the already great. Uh, performances that are there uh, it's just that the film never fleshes that out enough and always leaves me wanting more so if you've ever felt that way or you ever wanted to know more about how that developed or it interested you to that point where you were thinking about that stuff Benson's novelization is a must read uh, again it follows the same story as the film and it's not like it, it's a whole extra chapter of material for that but what is there is is really going to enrich the viewing experience every time you go back to the film so this is another uh, really essential novelization next we move to double shot from 2000 this being a book two of the so-called union trilogy so here is the u.s first edition and here the image is of Bond seeing his double, which is literally the, the major plot point of, of the book. And the nice bit of continuity is, due to the injuries sustained at the end of High Time to Kill, it sets up Bond not being at the top of his game. And then, of course, over the course of the plot of the book, he starts to doubt his own sanity. So this book definitely has uh, great echoes of From Russia With Love in, in terms of it being a, uh, a very convoluted plot and Bond being in the middle of it and being also the target of an organization's uh, revenge. So here's the book itself. And here what they did was they actually put 007 inside of a bullet. So um, it's, it's rare for, for books to do special designs on the actual uh, book itself. But uh, anytime somebody does, that, that makes me excited because I'm like, oh, wow, somebody took a, a little bit of extra attention to detail. But that's it, it's very simple, but I, it's, again, very cheeky, and I, I really enjoy that. And then here's the spine. Here they've gone for this yellow on the end papers. This is the book where Benson does really try and, and shake up uh, the traditional Bond novel formula. He does try and do things a bit differently, which I do appreciate. And it is, it is the one of his novels that has grown on me more the more that I've read it over the years. And then here is the paperback version with Bond in front of essentially Icaritas, uh, setting up the bullfighting that features in the plot and the Spanish locale. And everything is nicely embossed on here and a nice uh, Bond silhouette there. And here the actual image carries over onto the uh, rear jacket as well. So this came out a full year after the hardcover in June 2001. Definitely starting to feel old the more I go through these books. Next, we move on to Never Dream of Dying, which is part three in the finale of the Union Trilogy of books. This is the U.S. first edition, which changes the cover slightly by having the uh, central image be in between the Bond logo and the title. And this one, is, it's very simple. It's a jagged knife blade instead of something suggesting the setting of the actual book. And 
And this is the one I vividly remember going into a Books A Million and seeing it on display when it was brand new and being able to purchase the hardcover in person. Here they've just gone for a plain sort of foil 007 logo printed on the actual hardcover of the book itself. There's the spine. Here they've gone for a more orangish style of in paper. And then they added an image of an eye staring on the actual um, title page, which is very much in keeping with the book and its uh, themes of eyes and, and staring and the actual central villain's uh, conceit that he is a Bond villain who is actually blind, which of course uh, explains why uh, the Union is somehow obsessed with eyes. Here, the actual uh, typeface and layout and chapter headings have changed a little bit as well. And we move on to the U.S. paperback, where here they have actually brought back the uh, classic Bond silhouette from the 80s. This is the same one that adorned the uh, 80s printing of Goldfinger that I grew up with and was my first real James Bond novel. So uh, seeing this always brings back fond memories. It's probably my favorite of all the sort of anonymous James Bond silhouettes we've had over the years. I just have always loved the posture and I've stared at it for many hours on end. And of course the background is suggesting the uh, French uh, port locations. The, the, the book has primary locations throughout France and Nice and into Corsica as well. And of course, just as with the others, everything is embossed here on the actual cover. There's the matching spine. So all these go nicely on a shelf next to each other. And again, the imagery is carried over onto the back. And this was printed in May of 2002. And now we have the sixth and final of Benson's novels, 2002's The Man with the Red Tattoo, uh, set in Japan, which of course explains the, uh, the dragon tattoo motif on uh, both the U.S. first edition and the uh, U.S. paperback. Again, keeping with the same designs as followed, uh, you know, following uh, the uh, previous five books, here on the first edition, we have this nice blood red background with the same matching cover and spine design. So all of these go nicely on a shelf together as well. The rear, uh, it's very, very simple, but it looks nice and classy with the uh, contrasting red and black. Again, have the dragon tattoo on the rear as well. This one has probably the fanciest of the, uh, well, it is the fanciest of this of the custom printing on the actual book itself. So when you take off the dust jacket, you have this really nice uh, embossed uh, red and black design that sort of makes this look like uh, you're, you're looking at uh, a particular book or maybe a screen of sorts. Uh, so that's just a really, really nice touch that is you know always unexpected. And then the actual spine is red on black. Of course, the end papers are red. And that design carries on into the actual book itself. And it's also on each of the chapter headings. Now we move on to the U.S. paperback, and again we have the Goldfinger silhouette from the 80s Goldfinger paperback, but here it's been reversed. This silhouette is, has been used a number of times in different scenarios. Again, I don't know why it's always this particular one. I don't really mind because it's my favorite, but uh, it's, it's rather strange to have the last two paperbacks have the, the same silhouette. Again, everything matches the previous five, and everything is nicely embossed. There's the matching spine and the rear, and the dragon tattoo pokes its head in on the bottom. So 
So this was printed in May of 2003. And then lastly, we have the 2002 novelization for the film Die Another Day. I purchased this day of release uh, at, at, a, at a Books A Million, I believe. Uh, and I remember vividly uh, waiting till I saw the film before I actually sat down and read the novelization because I didn't want to spoil anything. Of course, the film has uh, earned a, a rather shall we say, less than stellar reputation. Uh, it has many issues, many over-the-top elements, many many groan-inducing moments, but the novelization, while it's not going to fix all of those issues, uh, a lot of problems are inherent to the film's storyline and it's sort of conflicting visions of where it wants to go. Uh, there are a number of additions that are really welcome. There's a number of extra bits of character backstory, uh, extra pieces of uh, Bond's internment in North Korea for 14 months, uh, some really wonderful additional sequences. My particular favorites being uh, when Bond first escapes uh, after uh, being confronted by M and basically being stripped of everything, uh, he escapes and has to make uh, several uh, attempts to even get some working capital and to even be able to get clothing and food. He doesn't just immediately go to the Yacht Club Hotel in Hong Kong. Uh, he actually has to get out of uh, Seal, South Korea first, and he has to uh, you know get money and uh, use use his wits and start to essentially come alive again and there's this wonderful sequence that Benson comes up with that feels to me very reminiscent of the uh, the Robert Ludlum Jason Bourne the Jason Bourne of the Ludlum novels particularly the Bourne identity uh, and in the way that he assesses a situation and is able to essentially uh, pilfer money from criminals without their knowledge and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful moment that I really wish was in the film uh, a number of little flourishes like that are really welcome I've also noticed over the years rereading this uh, the actual dialogue for Bond is a bit stronger than what we get in the film Bond seems to uh, in the novelization retain more of his own identity and and more weight to his dialogue uh, that I, I find really helpful. And also there's some other really nice bits. I also like that in the novelization, uh, when they're in the finale on board the Antonov, that Bond actually encounters uh, General Moon again. And there's this sort of uh, full circle moment in reference to uh, Bond's internment at, that opened the film. And uh, my I, there's this bit of business where Benson has Bond give... Uh, General Moon, the actual gun that, that he will use um, shortly thereafter when he confronts uh, uh, Gustav Graves. And and that sort of, there's this little pause where it's like, you know, the, the, the Bond acknowledges that Moon tortured him for all those months and that it's essentially at that moment water under the bridge. It's a really wonderful moment. It should have been in the film. It's fantastic. Uh, the book has a, a number of little flourishes like that. Uh, it doesn't fix everything, but if you have a lot of issues with the film and always try and get past those you might want to check out this novelization because I think it will be a, a nice welcome surprise I've found novelizations for films with terrible reputations can sometimes be a bit more palatable uh, to get past some of that stuff and this one has has a number of, of really nice extra bits so I, I do also highly recommend this one as well uh, it is trickier to find now it's not as if these were ever reprinted uh, this uses the uh, primary U.S. one-sheet art, which honestly is one of the best posters for the film, even though it's very plain and rather generic, but the sort of blue uh, streaking light uh, has, has always looked nice enough on the actual U.S. one-sheet. And then rather oddly, they used the sort of 80s, 90s uh, Berkeley-style James Bond is back on the rear, And you get the uh, text, font, and layout of the Benson novels. Now we move on to the uh, later published uh, omnibus editions of the six Benson novels. 
you can still find these. And what's great about them is that they actually included uh, his uh, Bond short stories, of which some of them are longer than when they were originally published, particularly Blast from the Past is much longer than the original version that was published in Playboy magazine. And trying to find where these were originally published it can be expensive and hard to do. Uh, they were published in Playboy, and uh, Live at Five was published at... Um, I believe it was in, in a TV guide, but uh, you can find them uh, much more easily here. Now, of course, they are broken up into uh, the Union books are brought together in this Union trilogy uh, book that was brought out first, and then the other three novels were brought out in this volume called Choice of Weapons. So um, they're technically out of order, but it sort of makes sense that the Union trilogy was published together, and they're done in this nice matching art style. The only problem, really, is that, of course, they you can still find them, but they're they're sort of in and out of print, so I, I pay, wound up picking these up used. Uh, I didn't need them for the novels. I just wanted to get the short stories all in one place and get the longer uh, Blast from the Past. So, uh, as you can see, this, this copy of Choice of Weapons, due to the uh, remainder mark on the bottom, is obviously a remainder copy. But uh, since these are so thick and they're soft covers, they are... Not exactly the easiest thing in the world to read, as you can see, they're they're quite large. Um, they, you know, they're they're fine, but obviously the spines will get worn the more you read them. And uh, I much prefer having the individual books. But uh, if you're looking for a cheap way to just read all the Benson novels in one go, uh, providing you can you can still find these uh, in print somewhere, uh, this would be your your best option. Plus, you're getting his uh, short story material as well. There's the rear for each. I'll show you the interior so you get an idea. Um, the, the, these are, a, you know, the, the pages are, are very thin, and uh, but at least the actual font size is large enough. Again, these are not in pristine, perfect shape, but what's also nice is that Benson wrote an introduction for each, so they really are essential for that and the, the short story material. So if you're a completist like me, you will wind up having to have these anyway. Just to give you an idea of what the actual book text looks like for each. And of course, as you're flipping through, you know, the, the layout's fine and, and these will work, but but again, it is not it's it's a little bit more unwieldy than having the original hardcover or paperback for each novel. And flip into the actual text, you get an idea. It's the same exact type, but uh, this one is obviously much thicker. That's why the size dimensions are a little bit different. So there was a slight gap after Benson uh, essentially uh, hung up his shoulder holster in terms of being a Bond author, and then uh, we had to wait until 2008 before uh, Ian Fleming Publications uh, announced and released the next James Bond continuation novel, which is here uh, shown as Devil May Care with Sebastian Falk, but the uh, sort of conceit being that Falk was writing as Ian Fleming, and there was a lot in the press releases and, and uh, release fanfare about this notion, which really, did, that's just sort of a, a blurb. I don't know exactly why they went for that type of idea. Um, now, on these later books, I don't have uh, paperbacks for all of them. Uh, this is the original uh, U.S. art with this rather nice wraparound spine. Let me see if I can... I'll show you the back. And there's a, a nice sort of texture printing to this. I, I like the design of this jacket very much, but the actual... The, the red and the, the title and the actual Bond type image used does immediately make you think uh, 60s Connery era Bond, Bond of the actual Eon films instead of Bond of the novels. In the UK, there was the really nice but very simple striking art of the, uh, the, the girl figure with the sort of like flame-like design coming out of her head, almost like her hair was, was, was a fire on a, on a black background. Here's the entirety of the dust jacket, so you can see the wrap around more clearly. And then the actual book doesn't have any uh, fancy printing on it. There's the spine. 
Here's the interior. Now, the thing with this book is it was really the first time that we had a Bond continuation author writing uh, supposedly to be in around the period of when Fleming was writing his novels. So this is the first uh, where it was not Bond set in the current day of when the novel was written, unlike, say, the John Gardner or Raymond Benson novels. This is placing Bond right back in, uh, smack into the Cold War era, and essentially is supposed to take place in the timeline sometime after the uh, Fleming canon of books. Next came 2011's Carte Blanche, written by Jeffrey Deaver. Uh, the notable part about this book is that this was essentially a complete reboot of the literary 007. It proved to be a one-off and is definitely the James Bond novel I have returned to the absolute least. Uh, the first time I read it, I, I really just didn't, didn't care for it at all. Uh, nowadays, I can sort of better appreciate what Deaver was, was trying to go for, and uh, he did go to great lengths to sort of essentially come up with a new entire back history for James Bond and the world of, of Bond's MI6 and the literary Bond, but in the, the modern realm. So essentially this, this Bond is a veteran of, of the Gulf Wars instead of having served to some degree in World War II. Uh, the, the most uh, number of the traditional Bond elements are there, but then other things are altered or changed. So this is definitely a, a real outlier in terms of the literary Bond. It does have its contingent of fans. It has uh, an equally <laughs> vociferous contingent that that despises this book. Um, I, again, I, I've really only read this uh, maybe two or three times, and I really need to to give it give it a fresh reread and come at it again. But I, I really didn't care for it the first time, and then it was a, a very long time before I picked it up again. Simply because it it felt so much uh, uh, as 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 a attempt to do something anti Bondish. Uh, and it was very bizarre seeing the literary Bond uh, go through what the what the film series was doing in the modern era, which I really have no use for. Um, so here is the U.S. first edition, and then eventually I found uh, a decent copy in paperback form, which uses the exact same cover art design. Um, both of these are actually embossed and match up on their spines pretty well. Again, no fancy printing here. So this printing was in February of 2012. So that uh, it, it sort of experiment with carte blanche really didn't uh, set the world alight or uh, and definitely uh, deeply divided the literary Bond fandom. So we had to wait another two years for a Bond novel, which turned up in 2013's Solo by William Boyd here in the U.S. first edition hardcover with this really it, it's it seems simple at first but it's this really actually it's actually quite striking once you look at it uh with this golden black lined motif with uh, 007 poking through underneath the title um i definitely thought it was rather plain looking when when i first saw it the the image of it but when i actually uh went out and, and got a copy on day of release it's it's um i've i actually kind of fell in love with this jacket even though it's it's very simple now, this, again, is sort of carrying on the tradition set by Devil May Care. This is set uh, in the 1960s, 1969 specifically, and is supposed to be uh, Fleming's Bond in 1969. And then another nice touch, they uh, brought in this sort of cut edge uh, on, the, on the paper stock for the this particular U.S. printing, which uh, is something you just don't see in the continuation era of books. Now here on the actual book itself, there's a sort of lined uh, texture on here, which I don't know how visible that's going to be here on camera. It's not really showing up, but 
you can sort of see it there. And then here on the bottom is the uh, Harper logo printed in. There's the spine. Then of course the end papers are black. If I had to choose between these three, uh, Solo is probably probably the strongest. Uh, I don't really have a very high opinion of carte blanche, so that's not saying very much. But I think between Solo and Devil May Care, sort of doing this this attempt at doing uh, picking up the torch of, of Fleming's Bond, I think Solo is probably the stronger novel overall. Um, and it, it, this seems to have get uh, this seemed to have gotten pretty decent uh, a pretty decent reception when it was released, but then it was sort of a thing that sort of came and went, and then we entered another period of not knowing if there was going to be another new Bond novel on the horizon anytime soon. However, the wait was actually quite worth it, uh, since there was something on the horizon and uh, something that proved to be a, a really welcome surprise when it was announced, because the next author to pick up uh, the uh, continuation novel Torch for Bond uh, was an author I was already very well familiar with and honestly was the person that I had as my number one wish list choice to take over in terms of continuing the uh, literary adventures of James Bond. This turned out to be Anthony Horowitz, who I was already extremely familiar with from his best-selling series of Alex Ryder novels, uh, that series being a about the adventures of a reluctant young spy, uh, essentially going toe-to-toe -to -toe in a lot of ways with the official Young Bond novels that uh, Charlie Hickson was was busy writing. Uh, but uh, the Alex Ryder novels were very influenced by Fleming. There's a lot of Bond allusions and Bond references sprinkled throughout them. Just as I'd say there's there's quite a bit of uh, Le Carre and some Lynn Dayton in there as well, and of course some references to the films. Uh, he also ha has written some extremely extraordinary Sherlock Holmes novels uh, that were actually authorized by the Conan Doyle estate, uh, House of Silk and Moriarty. Uh, are, they're wonderful reads for Holmes fans. So it was a, a welcome surprise that he was uh, tapped to take over. And so that resulted in his first novel, Trigger Mortis, which was uh, based on uh, unused Fleming material. Both of these novels have that conceit, which is why you have uh, the uh, with original material by Fleming. So these are Fleming elements that had never seen the light of day before, and Horowitz was brought in to essentially take that as either a jumping off point or incorporate it into an entirely new story. So again, we have the notion of Fleming's Bond in a period adventure as opposed to it being uh, modern and present day. And both of these novels are wonderful uh, experiences for Bond fans, particularly of the literary variety. And it's fascinating to get the glimpses at Fleming material we just hadn't seen before. Now, both of these are the U.S. first edition hardcover versions. I haven't yet got them in paperback form, and they pretty much copy the uh, same exact jacket design. Uh, in the U.K., we get, they got some uh, really nice uh, jacket designs. I almost got the U.K. one for Forever in a Day, uh, which had a special edition that was unfortunately not able to get. Uh, but I really like what they did here in the U.S. Here on Trigger Mortis, there's this really nice stylized imagery that has a sort of matte finish. And then they're keeping the uh, 007 Circle logo that was on Solo and was on a number of the uh, reprints of the Fleming novels around this time. There's the book itself and the spine. Also great is I was also able to get the sort of uh, Harper blurb announcing uh, Horowitz as the author for Trigger Mortis. So this is this little, it's fashioned as a newsletter, but it's basically a, a little PR release from the time. So I've, I've kept this with the book and, and, and sort of the, the inside flap. And then moving on to Forever in a Day, which is his second novel. 
Again, there's a little bit of texturing here on the book itself, and then the Harper logo is printed down in the corner. The actual jacket itself has a, has a nice bit of texturing to the whole uh, printing. And then the end papers are a nice aqua, which suggests the, uh, the ocean waters is depicted on the front cover. So this came out in 2018, whereas Trick or Mortis was 2015. So it's been a little while, and uh, thankfully, just recently, it was announced that Horowitz would uh, continue on with his third novel. So, so of course, that means myself and many other Bond fans are eagerly anticipating and waiting for uh, his third novel to come out. Next, we move on to the Young Bond series, starting with Charlie Hickson's first novel, Silverfin, from 2005. The Hickson Young Bond novels are really underrated. They're, of course, supposedly aimed at younger readers, uh, much like uh, Horowitz's uh, Alex Ryder novels, but can be obviously enjoyed by Bond fans old and young alike. These, of course, are Fleming's Bond in a uh, scenario throughout the uh, bits that are not fully detailed in the uh, simplistic if not sketchy biography bits that we get in Fleming particularly in uh, Bond's obituary and you only live twice the novel and what was so rewarding about uh, getting into these and and reading them as they were released was that uh, Higson did you know in, intensive research and really tried to make sure all of his young Bond adventures fit within what details we had of the uh, official James Bond backstory from Fleming and to see the, the sort of linkages and, and arcs that would carry on into what was established in the actual Fleming canon. So these are our Bond books that should be read by all Bond fans. Don't look down on them simply because they are you know specifically aimed at uh, younger readers. Uh, this is a, a prime example of uh, really wonderful uh, parts of the literary side of, of a franchise or a series that while they're specifically aimed at younger readers are really wonderful and can be enjoyed uh, immensely by adult fans. So here I have the uh, U.S. first edition with this really nice uh, custom printed uh, jacket. Then I have the actual paperback uh, proof version, which is the obviously not for sale, not final art. And then the uh, later printing that uses the uniform design that was developed in the U.S. and U.K. and is probably the most iconic or what most people are going to think of when they think of the uh, Charlie Hickson Young Bond novels. So this was the copy I had and was most used to. And of course, they came out with a custom Young Bond logo to identify each book. This has these uh, sort of this sort of x-ray view of these uh, eel type creatures uh, but with this hollow foil printing, which makes them shine and reflect the light back, which is a really nice touch. And the actual printing is excellent. This feels like a, a full-on adult novel, but of course it, it's not. So the, the quality of, of the printing of all of these is really excellent. If it did say Young Bond on it, you could you know literally fool people into thinking that this was an actual uh, standard novel. No fancy printing on this one, but it's a nice sort of gray-white. There's the spine. Then here is the proof version that I stumbled across. Um, I, I don't think there's any specific text differences or anything like that in here, but it was just a, a variant I stumbled across. And it's not often that you stumble across uh, advanced uncorrected proofs all the time, and this is in perfect shape. So I, I couldn't say no when I found it for um, literally you know less than a dollar. Everything else is essentially the same as the hardcover version. And then here is the later version to tie in with the uh, matching art design. And I, I love the commissioned art for all of the, this particular uh, version of the series. And these were printed in both hardcover and this sort of trade paperback form. And I have a mixture of them. I would like to have all of the hardcovers of uh, this particular run. There's the spine. And all of the spines on these match, so they form a nice uniform look on your shelf. 
the actual text and layout is, of course, the same as what's in the other two copies. And of course, the strange things about these uh, is that, of course, uh, they were under the Miramax Books imprint here, and then that eventually just became Disney Books. So uh, it is very strange seeing any sort of uh, James Bond anything with with a Disney logo on it. That just seems like something that should uh, never be. But uh, thankfully, it's it's just because it, it wound up on the Disney Books imprint here in the U.S. Next, we have book two, which is 2006's Blood Fever. Here I have the uh, U.S. and uh, hardcover and paperback version. Interestingly, they wound up commissioning uh, two completely different uh, cover art designs. Um, both look quite exceptional, and of course, uh, this paperback version is a little rough around the edges, but you know, everything else is the same, and uh, I just couldn't resist the, the different art. Uh, I really love the look of this particular series and this print run. I think they did a really impressive job with these. Again, they had the matching Young Bond logo and all the spines match. So even if you have a, a, a mixture of hardcover and softcover versions, the, the spines will relatively match up pretty well. As you can see, this paperback one uh, copy is a little rough. Um, and all these trade paperback versions were printed a couple years later in 2009. So that's why they already carry the uh, Disney Books imprint. Here's the hardcover version without the dust jacket. There's the spine. Next up is 2007's Double or Die, the third of the Hickson Young Bond novels. Uh, here I have two paperbacks. This is the uh, later U.S. trade paperback with this absolutely gorgeous uh, cover art. I really want to get this in the hardcover version as well. And then I stumbled across a copy of a later UK paperback printing, which has this uh, new updated cover design. And this is uh, pretty much what you're going to find now if you go looking for the uh, Higgs and Young Bond novels. I believe this is the version that's in print, this sort of cover art design and layout. Then here is the UK version. A little roughed up, but I found this for so cheap that uh, I, I, it's one of those uh, one of those random books you find, and you, you you have to wonder why somebody would charge you a nickel for it instead of just literally giving it away. But yeah, this this was literally sitting in a in a in a bookshop uh, dump bin for for a nickel. So uh, I can't pass up James Bond editions if you aren't already well aware of that from uh, this series of videos. So this version was published in 2012. Next up is book four, Hurricane Gold, again with really beautiful looking cover artwork. Here you can see the difference between a clean hardcover version and a clean U.S. trade paperback version that came later. Uh, again, either either one is fine, but uh, given the option, I, I do like having the hardcover version around. The printing on these, I have to admit, is just really well done and far above the, the usual sort of printing quality that you find on most children's books, even today. Uh, so I, I really have to commend uh, Miramax, Hyperion, slash Disney, because it's all in the same imprint, uh, for, for this particular run. And I really want to uh, get clean, uh, really minty hardcovers for all of these. Spines match up pretty well. Going for a nice brown on this one.
And then the paperback follows the exact same layout. And then the fifth and final of the Charlie Hickson Young Bond novels by Royal Command here in the matching U.S. first edition hardcover with really nice artwork. And then here the slightly more generic but uh, matching uh, design to the British paperbacks of the time. This is the British paperback version with a nice sort of foil type uh, hollow finish to the actual jacket. itself has a nice dark gray color then here's the UK paperback I believe they've slightly updated this as well to fit in with uh, the um, other British paperback I showed earlier. This one says it was printed in 2009. As you can see, this has uh, different covers for the books that uh, here you see what is on the U.S. hardcover of Silverfin. There's a number of uh, different print runs for these Young Bond books with different covers and sizes and formats, so uh, it's actually quite perplexing why there's so many. So after this, there was a, another period of, of a gap between books, and then eventually Young Bond was revived with these uh, Steve Cole penned novels, starting with Shoot to Kill in 2014. I just recently was able to get all of these in paperback form. These are actually quite tricky to get a, a hold of in, in physical terms, uh, especially here in the U.S. They're not very much available. These first two ones are much easier to get a hold of than, than the uh, the third and fourth novels. And the hardcover versions are, are almost non-existent. Uh, but you can get these in paperback form like I have here with these uh, pretty nice matching designs. So of course these are uh, later print versions. Uh, these have a number of variations just like the Hickson novels. Not quite as many because these are newer and, and uh, have been printed less. But uh, as you can see here, this is what the uh, Hickson novels look like now in their current print version. So if you order them, uh, this is what you'll probably wind up getting. And these are all uh, seemingly British versions. I ordered these online here in the U.S., and this is what you know showed up at my doorstep. So apparently they printed all of these in the U.K. and then are just selling some over here in the States. I do like that they made this special young bond will return on the uh, last page. Then comes Heads You Die. Next comes uh, book three of this Young Bond series, Strike Lightning. Again, these are the uh, seemingly the UK paperbacks. And then the fourth and final of this series uh, so far to date is 2017's Red Nemesis, shown here. So 
So that does it for the official uh, Ian Fleming Publications Young Bond novels to date. However, I do have one other book that slots in the young readers section for James Bond that I, I felt I had to go over at this point. Uh, it's, it's another random sort of outlier book. Uh, it's uh, part of a series that most Bond fans are probably not aware of at all, but uh, I, I thought it would be fitting to end this video to uh, go over this particular part of the uh, young Bond facet of the literary Bond canon. And that, of course, is 1985's James Bond in Program for Danger, number 13 of the Ballantine Find Your Fate series. This was their attempt to cash in on the popular uh, Choose Your Own Adventure type of books. And this is a very bizarre part of Bond in novel form. This is a tie-in to the film View to a Kill, and there were actually four of these written and included in the Find Your Fate series, which also had a number of Indiana Jones tie-in books as well, also featuring really beautiful commissioned artwork. Uh, so here you have Roger Moore's likeness done very well. Uh, this this actual cover image, you know, it could have been used for an official uh, James Bond novel or a tie-in for, for A View to a Kill if they wanted to. It's really well done. Unfortunately, these are exceptionally rare. I've only managed to stumble across this one. It's the only physical copy I've ever seen of any of these. I do have two of the Indiana Jones uh, Find Your Fate books, but uh, the James Bond ones are even rarer and harder to find than those, and these always command uh, a nice... Uh, a quite quite a substantial amount on the used market. If they do pop up on eBay, uh, they will cost you quite a bit. I really do want to find uh, the other three at some point. Now, these are obviously not doing the literary bond, but it's not quite exactly the film bond either. Uh, what's also interesting is you have characters from the film appear in the, the book. So you have uh, Zorin appear, you have Mayday appear, but what's also interesting about these is in the Choose Your Own Adventure books, uh, as most everyone is probably well aware of, of them by this point, you wind up reaching a certain point in the story and you have to turn to a page and make a decision. But what's interesting about these is uh, it's not just going to give you a bad ending. You can actually get James Bond killed. There are actual death scenarios in these particular books, which I found uh, really fascinating. Usually they, the Choose Your Own Adventure books books wouldn't go to that level of story darkness because these were still ostensibly aimed at children or young readers. Now, certain of these books were essentially original stories, but uh, this one is one that actually directly ties into characters from the film A View to a Kill, and uh, it was really fascinating to read. I wound up reading all of the various adventure paths just to see everything, and it is part of the matching series, so all of these spines go together. It's just unfortunate this is the only one I've ever been able to find. Again, these are very difficult to come by. But this one's in really nice shape, so I was very pleased to find this. And what's great is that uh, this series it does have uh, full-page illustrations throughout. They are black and white, but they're quite well done, and it really helps to enliven the experience. This is a really strange experience reading this because uh, part of you in, in your head thinks of the literary bond, part of you thinks of the film bond. It's weird to see Max Zorin doing all kinds of stuff that you know, you've know never seen him do before or Mayday do stuff. Uh, it does involve computing as essentially the plot MacGuffin and uh, Zorin's new high-tech invention that Bond keeps getting away with depending on what adventure path you follow. And there's a number of different endings and a number of different plot points depending on... Uh, uh, how you go about things and again in this book if you make the wrong turn and you make the wrong move you can possibly get bond killed there are some endings that are more mediocre but there are dark endings or endings that are cold endings so it's a very strange experience that having that happen and literally having <laughs> james bond dead because of you you know you feel definitely quite a bit guilty at, at uh, the thought of that. If you're a fan of the Roger Moore era of Bond, these are a must. If you're a fan of a, view to, of a View to a Kill, these are a must. It's a really interesting part of the film's tie-in marketing campaign. It's something that never gets referenced or covered. 
However, recently, in the wonderful reference tome, uh, The Lost Adventures of James Bond, uh, Mark Edlitz did an entire chapter section devoted to these books and actually tracked down the original authors and people who were developing this at, uh, at the time. And uh, it's really wonderful because I was able to finally learn more about the other three books that I've never been able to read. And uh, it was really fascinating to hear how they put these books together and they tried to cram in as many uh, Bondian elements as possible. So I figured I would include this here since this is essentially also James Bond for young readers, even though it is not the literary James Bond. Uh, I didn't have anywhere else to slot this in, and of course I have it on my James Bond bookshelf. I hope to someday find the others and have all of the James Bond Find Your Fate books because this, this is a heck of a lot of fun to read, and it's this bizarre little uh, subsection or, or corner of the uh, James Bond in printed form universe. So that's it for this video. This this brings us up to the current day with all of the continuation novels. Again, uh, Anthony Horowitz will be writing a third book, so uh, Forever in a Day will be followed in probably, I think, a, about a year or two uh, with his uh, third novel, which again was just recently announced in the past month. So that's, that's good and encouraging news. And uh, it's really hard to believe that we're almost at the 25th anniversary of Zero Minus Ten, so that's going to be coming up next year, along with the 25th anniversary of Tomorrow Never Dies. Of course, the other interesting thing is Zero Minus Ten is set around the Hong Kong handover, which is the original story idea for Tomorrow Never Dies that uh, MGM pretty much nixed uh, at the last minute. So, uh, And this, this way we did get our James Bond Hong Kong handover story. And... Since I, I do love the paperbacks, it would be nice. I haven't yet gotten uh, paperback editions of some of the later books, like I Need One for Solo. And I would like to get them for the Horowitz books, uh, simply because I just hate having to take hardcovers around because I'm always afraid of dinging them up or tearing the dust jackets. Of course, I usually leave the dust jackets at home. And I, again, I'm a paperback person at heart, so I, I would like to get those as well. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So that does it for this particular video. Uh, again, as always, please leave any comments you have down below uh, about your own Bond book collection, your own thoughts about the later continuation novels, or uh, if, if you have never read them, uh, you know, uh, if you'd like to, uh, any thoughts, comments, questions, uh, please leave those below. I'm always happy to, to uh, go over them. I love hearing from uh, anybody who decides to listen to me babble about uh, James Bond novels. And with that, uh, please stay tuned for the next in this series. Yes, there will be a next in this series. Originally, I was just going to do all this in one video, and I suddenly realized this is going to take way too long. So I thought I would split it into two, then three, then four. So the fourth video in this series will deal entirely with my James Bond reference book collection. So this is everything from biographies to books on the film series to books on the novels, or and also including books on Fleming and uh, things like the wonderful Lysette uh, Fleming biography. So uh, that one will be its an entirely own separate video uh, to follow these. So stay tuned for that. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.